centered? Hmm? Are you centered? Centered? Yeah. Have to get centered. centered in your phone. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. Pastor Ruben, thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday. Wednesdays and Fridays at 9 a.m. So if you're ever in the community, you'd like to come on by and visit us here at the church. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are in the book of Galatians and we're looking at chapter 5. Let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> oh, gracious Father, thank you for another day. Lord, we need, uh, need your grace today, Father, to... Get through the day, Lord, as we begin a new week, new challenges, Father, and hopefully uh, you'll lead us and guide us, Father, in all of those things that we deal with today, Father. Lord, may we just begin our day today with, with just opening up your word, <clears throat> allowing your spirit to minister to us, and hopefully take some, some golden nuggets away today, Father, and it will help us as we walk with you today, Lord. Bless us through your Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, open up your Bibles <clears throat> to Galatians chapter 5 as we continue on. I, I love the way Paul starts this chapter with stand fast. Stand fast. In other words, be unmovable. Now, I've noticed in, in my life that there are certain people that can stand pretty fast. And they're like two-year-olds, very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> and then I notice there's others who can't stand fast at all. I mean, they're, they're just the opposite. They break down completely <laughs> after situations. So when Paul says stand fast here, he's talking spiritually in the faith, in the liberty <coughs> that we have in Christ. And this is something you can only do through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it in the flesh. And so... The power that we get to do these things are always through prayer. And that power is obtained through Jesus Christ as we pray and ask for him to give us the strength to stand fast. And he says, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made, you, made us free and do not be estranged or entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Again, he's talking about the law and grace. So we have liberty and grace, and we have uh, bondage uh, in the law. What does that look like for us? How do we know if we're in bondage, or how do we know if we're living by, by grace? Well, bondage is difficult. <clears throat> you'll always struggle. You'll always be um, struggling within yourself, whether you're you're doing the right thing or not. You'll feel guilt. You'll feel, feel condemnation. You'll feel like you never measure up. Those are the things that come with following a law because you'll realize that you can't follow the law all the time. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll miss the mark and then you'll start thinking, oh, I just can't do this. What is wrong with me? God, why did you choose me? You know, why did you call me? I'm struggling with this. And that's the law. It puts you under a bondage where grace and liberty teaches you to walk that way. That, oh, Lord, I'm not going to be able to do this. So if I can do this, praise God that you have helped me to do as much as I can, but the rest I have to leave in your hands. I have to trust in you. And there's a peace in that. Uh, and there are some that, that do that very well. In fact, from the outside, you look at those people and it almost seems like they don't care about whether they do something right or wrong uh, to you. But the reality is, is they're living by grace. They're, they do care it's just that when they do it wrong, they're just trusting God to fill that in, right? And, and they're not gonna Amen. they're not gonna be guilty over it. So uh, that's a gift that God gives us. And Paul is saying here, don't don't be in, entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I Paul say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. So again, there, there are religious leaders, Jews, who are coming into the Galatian camp and they're telling them they need to get circumcised. And Paul's saying, no, you don't. You don't need to be circumcised. That's, that is a work of the flesh. That is a work from the Old Testament under the law. It was actually a covenant between Abraham and um, God that God would keep his covenant with Abraham to multiply his seed, the children of Israel. 
Uh, and so it wasn't even, even anything that you did to gain favor. It was just to remind them that God's covenant was going to be kept by him. When, when God made a covenant with Abraham, they walked through uh, an animal. They had sacrificed an animal, they split it in two, and both companies are supposed to walk through it to signify that each part will keep his part. Well, when Abraham and God uh, were doing that ritual and that contractual agreement, God actually put Abraham to sleep and God just walked through it. And he split the animal uh, by fire. And so it signified that God would keep the plan because Abraham couldn't do it. So God would keep the covenant. He would be the one that's faithful and not Abraham himself. And, and so um, when we uh, come before the Lord, it is his grace and mercy that keeps us. And it's not circumcision at all, Paul is saying. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Okay, so again, if you're going to boast about the fact that you're circumcised, then you better keep the whole law because it's the whole law that's important to you. And so if you err in one point, you've erred in the whole law, um, Paul tells us in another book. So if you're going to boast about keeping one law, which we can all keep at least one law for a bit, um, that's not a boast at all. Keep the whole law if you're going to profit anything. You have become uh, estranged uh, from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, he uses the word justified. In other words, uh, you're keeping a commandment or some ritual or some law in order to be saved, justified before God, having a right standing before God. And you just can't because you'll break the law. The only way that you can stand right before God is through grace. It's the work of Jesus Christ that God sees, not through the law. And if you think that, then you've fallen from grace. You're no longer under grace. For we, uh, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This uh, persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Now that's important because it doesn't come from God. Amen. So when you're trying to live by a law, and there are people out there, well, I live under the golden rule. Well, that's not from God because God tells us very clearly that we can't live under the golden rule. We're going to fail. And someone says, I live by that law. Ask them how they're doing. Have they kept it? Well, they'll usually say no, not all the way, but I'm trying. See, that's why we can't do it. So we have to live by grace. God hasn't asked us to do that at all. It doesn't come from him. It comes from our own flesh or from the enemy that is trying to destroy us. So you ran well, he says. This persuasion comes from not from God. And he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear this, his judgment, whoever he is. Um, and I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off, <laughs> that they would, cut, they would circumcise themselves uh, that are causing problems in the church and trying to get people to stay under that law. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now he's repeating what Jesus said, right? Yes. Paul has learned well. He's learned from his Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus said there's, there's two commandments that he's given us, and we find this in the gospel. The first commandment is to love God with all our might, soul, strength, and power. Um, that's the first commandment. And the second is just like it in that it's love, and that is love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those are the two commandments that God says. And if you can complete those, then there's no need for any law. Just keep those and you're fine. <clears throat> you notice a couple of things. Jesus didn't say, love yourself and then love your neighbor. Isn't that a teaching of the world today? Yeah. Learn to love yourself and then you can love someone else. Until you learn to love yourself, you really can't love anyone else. That's not true. That's unbiblical. The Bible teaches that you need to love others, love your neighbors. In fact, Paul even went 
on and said in Ephesians, no man ever hated his own flesh. And so we nourish, we cherish our own flesh. Even in, even in our, and I have to say this carefully because I know that people don't agree with this biblical view because they think that, that we struggle because we give, 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 and give, and give. And so we need to somehow think of ourselves first before thinking of someone else now because we've just been givers. We're caregivers. Uh, we're always handing out and helping. And there's times where you just need to help yourself before you can even go on. Now that's a little different than loving yourself though. I think that in, in, our, in loving ourselves, we, we take care of ourselves and we should take care of ourselves. Uh, we should, I'm not saying that you shouldn't take care of yourselves, you shouldn't eat right, shouldn't be healthy, you shouldn't think positive, you, you shouldn't get rid of people that are toxic in your relationships. I don't, think, I don't think that's what I'm saying. I'm saying is though that when it comes to it, and I'm sure it, it is punctilar, that in the situation you're to love someone more than yourselves. There will come those times of sacrifice where you have to love someone else more than you're loving yourself at that moment. Oftentimes, maybe not so often, but there are times when people ask me to go to a hospital visit. And sometimes my first thoughts is, oh, do I have to? You know, because I've got to go all the way over there. And I know the struggles of it. You know, you got to deal with all the parking. You got to deal with the attendance. You got to deal with the counter. You got to find the location, which you never do. You're traveling all hallways just to, you know, figure out the building numbers. I was at Riverside Community the other day and it said 412 and it said this way. So I went this way all the way down to a dead end and I'm like, where's 412? And I'm going all over and finally someone says, oh, around the corner to the right. I went that way. It wasn't there over. The so finally I, I found it, you know, it's just a hassle. Um, you know, so you just think, do I have to? But then that's where you say to yourself, I have to think more highly of others than I think of myself. And then you go, you find the person and you're able to share the gospel and they end up receiving the Lord and you get a blessing out of it, even though your heart wasn't right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's thinking of yourself. You know, a mother does that all the time. They're, they're trying to help themselves. They don't help themselves enough. You know, they don't take care of themselves because they're always taking care of their babies. They're watching over them and so forth. So they'll neglect themselves um, quite more often uh, than they will their own children. Um, so that concept is true to a degree, but Jesus said very clearly that we're to love our neighbors more than ourselves. So when that time comes, you're challenged to do that. And it's very biblical. He goes on and says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, I love the remaining part of this chapter because he gives us some very clear examples of walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. And so you can take these examples and apply them to your life very simply and very clearly. Not too often does the Bible <clears throat> give you ex great examples like this. You know, it'll just say, uh, purge all evil, and you're like, whoa what's evil? <laughs> you know, how do I purge the, the thing that I don't know if it's evil or not, you know, and so forth. And that's why it's important reading the whole Bible. You get a lot of stories in the Old Testament and you see what God likes and dislikes. You know, you see how he punishes and corrects in certain areas. So you can kind of learn from their situation, um, you know, uh, what they went through, like we just saw on Sunday where the kingdom was divided because of covetousness. You know, uh, we had Jeroboam who wanted to divide the kingdom and have his own uh, kingship and his own power, created his own religion and so forth. And so there's covetousness, their power, you know, status, and those are evil things when it comes into a man's heart uh, instead of thinking of others more highly than himself. So we can see those examples in the Old, Te in the Old Testament. And then you come to the New, and then you got to find some of these great examples. And so these are great examples, very clear. It says, if I say... <laughs> If I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now, Paul is kind of repeating what he says in Romans chapter seven, right? Uh, he basically said the same thing. There is a war between the flesh and the spirit of your individual person. Your body is flesh and this body is desiring to cater itself. That's all it does. And it will always do that as long as you're in this body. But your spirit 
is the, is the Spirit of God, and it desires uh, to meet the needs of others. It desires to be holy. It desires to do the right thing. It desires wonderful blessings from the Lord. Um, and they're always fighting against each other. And Paul said that in Romans chapter 7 very clearly. Uh, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And so he goes on now and describes the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are. And then he says evident means very clear. You can't argue this. You know, I'm sure there are some that are going to try to justify this, but you cannot argue these works of the flesh. And he lists them. Adultery is the first one. Um, <clears throat> adultery. Very clear what that means. Fornication. Very clear what that means. It comes right after adultery. It's, it's, it's sin, sexual sin for those that aren't married. Sexual sin <clears throat> for those that are married is adultery. And he, and he says uncleanliness. Now, a lot of these things have to deal with sexual immorality. Why is that? A lot of the flesh is dealing with sexual morality because that is one of the major sins that all humanity deals with from the very beginning. If you were to look at the Old Testament and you start tracing out some of the things that were um, wrong, uh, you will find that a lot of it is worshiping of Molech, a god of fertility, uh, Molech, which is a god of abortion, uh, because people were getting pregnant and they were aborting their children. And a lot of the sins is all based upon sexual immorality. In Egypt, the, the Samirs of that time, which was the earlier nations of those times that created writing, a lot of their stuff were just, just per, per, uh, what's the word? Not per, pornography, but pro, uh, pornographic. pornographic, yeah. Pornographic and so forth. So that is always one of the major, major uh uh, walls, obstacles for the Christian, for all Christians. And so he starts with that, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness. Those are all dealing with sexual, sexual immorality. And then he goes into idolatry, which can also deal with sexual immorality because you're idling those things. Sorcery, which also can deal with sexual immorality because you're altering your, your mind with drugs. And sorcery, by the way, is the word we get, where we get the word uh, pharmakia, pharmacist chemical drugs and alterations like marijuana. And, and believe me, marijuana is a sin. And God did not create the marijuana that we have today. God created a plant, if it was called marijuana at that time, but it was not a substance that was to be abused. It was a plant. And when sin came into the world, all of these things became corrupt and you were not to partake of them. And that's why God all of a sudden said, now you can't eat of these things. And he made it very clear, the hooves, and so forth, an unclean animal, the clean animals, because sin corrupted everything. And sin corrupted plants also. So you go before uh, the, the fall of man, and you see God created all these wonderful plants for us to use. But after the fall of man, there then became laws against these things because they were corrupt and evil and destructive. And so you, co you couldn't uh, no longer smoke marijuana or cocaine plants and things like that. You may have had them back then. Whether you ate them or not, who knows? But they weren't mind altering and body altering like they are today. So there is no case for you, for you to say, well, God created the marijuana plant. He did not create what we have today. That was not God at all. That was sin entering the world. So again, marijuana, it's tied into sexual immorality. Hatred, tied into sexual immorality. We're going to see Wednesday night, um, <clears throat> the laws for husbands who are jealous and what they can do if, they're, if they find their wives uh, committing adultery, uh, hatred, sexual immorality, uh, contentions, uh, you see all kinds of that. Uh, husbands murdering wives and wives murdering husbands um, or boyfriends and girlfriends and that type of thing. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions. <clears throat> then he even mentions heresies here. It's one that we always seem to neglect but heresies is just as guilty as adultery. And heresy is false teaching. If you're teaching something falsely, that's a heresy. So this whole concept about love yourself, you know, if you're teaching that, that's, that's actually a false teaching. You shouldn't be teaching that. Again, the balance, though, of it, and I just want to make that clear so that you understand me. Um, yes, we love ourselves. We already do. We don't have to learn to love ourselves. We already love ourselves. What we need to learn is to do is not love ourselves so much and sacrifice ourselves. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't take care of ourselves. We shouldn't go to the doctors. We shouldn't eat right. We shouldn't do those things. So um, those things are important. 
But if you're teaching something different, then that's, that's heresy. Like the other teaching is that we are inherently good. All humanity is inherently good. Is that what the Bible teaches? No. No. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. In the Old Testament, uh, Solomon said, uh, a man's heart is wicked and deceitful. He doesn't even know it. So no, the, the, the uh, tendency for mankind is to sin, not to be good. We have to actually fight to be good and learn to be good by our parents. And so that's another heresy if you're teaching people that you're inherently good, that ultimately we do good. Do we do good? Well, compared to one another, we might be better than someone else, <laughs> but that might not necessarily be good. There's always ulterior motives to the things that we do. You know, someone that gives large amounts of money from what I understand and from what I've heard, you know, these guys that make billions of dollars, they give billions of dollars, but then they're very picky on who they give them to, right? They don't just give them to the poor. They give them to groups that are going to support their businesses, groups that are going to help them push their agenda and so forth. So there's always an underlying um, <clears throat> purpose. And, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Where, where they're trying to get something done a motive behind it too. So he goes on, he says, envy, murder, drunkenness, revileries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Underline practice, because I think that is so important. And we mentioned it on Sunday, right, in the teaching, and how Paul was talking to the Corinthians, and how we're not to keep company with the church who are practicing these things, right? The world practice these things. They, they, they practice, and that's why they're not inheriting the kingdom of God because this is their lifestyle. This is what they do. They don't know anything better to do than to do these things. And for the world, this is, this is common practice. I remember having a boss, uh, after I told him, you're lying to me. He goes, Reuben, that's, that's, that's common. And it's something that we all know that we should do in order to get our... our um, perspective, you know, done, or our side done, or I'm lacking words today, you know, our, <clears throat> whatever our position will lie, and it, it's a given. You just don't want to get caught doing it, but they'll lie if they, if they can, and that's the world, but when it comes to Christians, we shouldn't be practicing these things, so that word practice is important there, so if you're practicing these works of the flesh, then something's wrong with your walk with Jesus Christ. You shouldn't be practicing these things. What you should be practicing and, and keeping on your mind is the next thing, the fruit of the Spirit. Look at verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So practice loving one another. Uh, joy, finding joy in the things that you do. Finding joy in some of the things that, that uh, you're participating in, <coughs> whether they're family or church. Uh, looking for, for places that bring you joy. Looking for joy in places that maybe you haven't looked before. And peace, the same thing. The peace of God, first of all, that you're at peace with God with your salvation, you're at peace with God with your walk, and you're at peace with one another. Uh, Long-suffering, uh, that means patient. Practice being patient. That's a hard one. That's a hard one. That all of us are always practicing. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, which can mean trust. Gentleness, which means meekness, which is power under control. Just being gentle with people, uh, self-control, against such there is no law. Uh, gentleness, I'm trying to be, gen I'm learning to be gentle. Uh, in all my years, sometimes I'm very blunt at saying things and I'm trying to, to preface things now with, with things like, uh, you know, you're important, the Lord loves you, I love you, care about you, your walk, and so forth, and these are all important things, but then, you know, <laughs> this is, what we have to work towards. We all work towards those things, but we're, we're gonna work through this together and not just point this out in you and say, now go do it, you know, idiot. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. You have to be as gentle as possible. Um, it might have worked in the past, it might work with kids, but it doesn't work very well with adults. Being gentle, self-control. Self-control here uh, means does not lose its temper does not lose its temper. Against such, there is no law. Now, notice that. There is no law against these. If you, if you practice these things, there's no law for you. You're doing the right things in your, in your walk with the Lord. You don't have to worry about you know, the law and keeping it. 
you're okay. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if you're Christ, there is a work for you to do, and that is to crucify, or as some would say, murder your own flesh. Give up your own hurts and pains for others, your own passions, your own desires, as he says here. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Are these things easy to do? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> The things that are easy to do are the other ones, right? The works of the flesh are easy to do. It's easy to get angry. It's easy to be selfish. It's easy to be ambitious, but it's hard to do the others. I find it hard. I purposely try to do certain things, and still I find it hard. You'll notice that if, if we're having an event, I try to eat at the end of the event. Though there's times I'm hungry and I want to eat before, and I'll even kind of sample the food. I'll go, oh, I gotta sample the food, make sure you guys are cooking right, because I'm hungry, you know, and I can't wait. But I'll purposely try to eat at the end. And, that, and that's a, a purpose, you know, uh, work that I try to do. I mean, because I'm hungry and I want to get over there, but I do it purposely because I have to deny my flesh and let everyone else go, go first. Whenever I'm at places, it doesn't matter whether it's pastor's meetings or other meetings, I'm always trying to get up once I'm done eating and I throw my plate away or, and or I'll pick up other people's plates and throw them away too. That's what you should be doing, practicing those things. They're very difficult, but then eventually they get easy to do. It becomes a part of your habit and your life and then you don't even second guess it, you just do it. You know, and you also find like for instance, and I'll just share an instance, and it's just something, an observation, it may be true or not, but from my perspective, I think it's true. Um, but I had gone to a pastor's conference for years, or pastor's meetings for years, and everyone usually just pick up their own plate and throw it away. Once in a while, a pastor pick up the guys next to him, but wouldn't walk around. So I just, when I got there, I started doing that, just walking around and picking everybody's plate that was done, and I throw it away. And I just did that every time I was there. Next thing I know, I see someone else, they'd get up and they would then do the same thing. Walk around and pick up people's plates. So it also encourages others to do the right thing too. It teaches them by your example. That is what a leader does. He leads by example. That's what a servant leader is, looks like, by the way. A leader is not arrogant. A leader doesn't just direct and point fingers. A leader actually leads by example. He's also a servant too. I wish I could do more of that today. But with my back, I, don't, I can't do as much as I used to. and That's such a, a heartache for me because I feel useless at times. I feel like I'm not measuring up and I'm not being that example. So pray for me because it, it's hard. Even right now, my back is just aching. <clears throat> so anyway, Paul's chapter is very clear for us on how we ought to walk. So I challenge you today, try to apply that part of the message today, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, and see how you do with that. And then you'll know where you're at as a gauge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And I pray, Lord, that all of my mumbling and words, Lord, just be discarded. <clears throat> and your word, Lord, would go forth, Father, with power and might, Lord, and you would allow it to accomplish what you desire to accomplish in each man's heart, exactly where they're at, Father, whether they have an ear to hear or not, Lord, you minister to their spirits, Lord. May they be blessed today as you lead them and guide them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, post them and we'll, we'll pray for you as we pray right now. God bless.